Thank you all today for uh, attending today's exit seminar. First up is Lauren. Lauren Saltillo was born and raised in Florida. She received her BA from Barnard College of Columbia University and her JD from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. After a short career as a corporate attorney, she needed a break and decided to work a harvest in Sonoma. She became hooked by the wine industry and worked a few more harvests in Napa and Australia before starting in our program. After graduation, she will continue to work at Mathiasen Winery in the vineyard and cellar. My experience with Lauren is that she's incredibly passionate, curious, and I have no doubt she will do big things in the wine industry. So without further delay, I hand it over to you, Lauren. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so as Andrew said, my name is Lauren and today I'll be discussing uh, the invocation of the terroir concept in wine and viticulture research related to climate change. Um, oops, I know I just looked at this. So just a presentation roadmap. First, I'll start with a brief introduction to the terroir concept. I'll talk about what terroir is and how it's defined and going specifically into the human and natural elements of terroir. Then I'll talk about the thematic categories of wine and viticulture related research, um, related climate change re research and how terroir is implicated in this work. And finally, I'll reiterate a few conclusions to be drawn from that body of literature. So a bit of terroir history. Um, wine has actually been tied to the place of its production since way, 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 way before the common era. Um, when wine was uh, shipped around the ancient world and uniquely shaped in flora, depending on the region it was coming from. So pottery transport jars in general were something that was introduced in the 15th century BC by the Canaanites on the Syrian Lebanese border. And then modified um, versions of these were adapted by the Egyptians in the 14th century, and then finally the Greeks in the seventh century. And it was really the Greeks um, who leaned into this region specific shape differentiation. So for instance, you can see here on the right in um, different amphora used to transport wine from two different Aegean islands. So this one on the left, A was um, from Chios or Chios and B, from Kos. And this Chian shape was so important to the people there that you can actually see in this figure that they it was emblazoned on their coins. Um, but then starting in around the fourth century BC, you would see a kind of a more uniformity in these amphora shapes. And you would start to see stamps being used on the clay and on closures. Um, there was scratch graf graffiti into the sides of amphora, and then painted symbols were used to um, describe vineyard name, vineyard owner, and even um, wine vintage on these vessels. So that's kind of the ancient history, but then the more modern concept of terroir, especially the French word terroir, really just dates back to the 17th century France um, when a name was given to this idea that physical environment was a source of distinctive taste in French food and wine. So this French concept of terroir then became overtly political with the 1855 Bordeaux classification, which promoted the idea of wine quality um, based on origin. And this was kind of a quasi-governmental deal. Uh, Napoleon III invited the Bordeaux Chamber of Commerce to arrange an exhibit of all the finest wine in the region. And they passed the buck over to the Syndicate of Courtiers, um, which was a wine merchant group, who then ultimately made the lists of the different growths. Um, and it was actually not until the phylloxera crisis in the 1860s, which was exacerbating the competitive pressures in the international wine market, that the French government um, actually largely in response to rioting that was happening between farmers and producers in Champagne, decided to step in and pass the first Appalachian law. And I would encourage you to check out the work of Dr. Colleen Guy if you're interested in learning more about um, the history of riots in Champagne and how that um, led to the evolution of the terroir concept there. But to finish the story, in 1935, a law was passed which led to the creation of the AOC system we know today and kind of was the start of this legal recognition of the relationship between wine origin, quality, and authenticity. 
um, at least in France. I will note that the first actual wine appellation was Chianti in 1776, or pardon me, no, that's America. In 1716, the Grand Duke of Tuscany uh, defined the boundary of the area of Chianti. And um, there was such a problem with people making wine from outside that area, but trying to call it Chianti, that in 1932, there was a ministerial decree um, that added the suffix classico, which I'm sure you're familiar with, to distinguish wine produced in that original area. And then also um, it, the first formal wine classification was not Bordeaux. It was actually a system that came out of Tokai, Hungary in 1730, um, which is all to say the story that we think of as being uniquely French uh, maybe isn't. Um, okay, so that's a little bit of history. And now we'll get into the components of terroir. So there are human factors and natural factors. And we'll start by talking about those human factors. And it's kind of a messy story to tell. So if terroir can be thought of in terms of suitability of land for the cultivation of grapes, as it often is in climate change literature, which we'll kind of look at later, it's not unreasonable to recognize that there are social, economic, and cultural rationales for growing certain grapes in certain regions, and that that is a human component of terroir. So for instance, humans have historically chosen to grow grapes near um, centers of consumption where that wine will actually be consumed. They've chosen to grow grapes in places that are not suitable for growing other crops or grazing cattle, right? So land that's not being used to actually sustain people with food. And then um, even in the Roman era, vineyards were also um, planted often along rivers because it was much cheaper to transport grapes and wine over water than it was over land. And then finally, uh, grape growing for winemaking is also really deeply tied to the colonial project worldwide. Um, so grape growing for wine was seen as a civilizing project that was a purported nonviolent method of um, subjugating the wild local landscape and the people on it. So in a lot of ways, a good place for growing quality wine grapes was really any place that needed to be conquered even if that quality wine never really came to be. And if you're interested in learning more about uh, the imperial and colonial history of wine in America, I would suggest you check out Erica Hanicle's Empire of Vines. And just as there are these social and economic and political rationales for growing grapes in certain places, we had similar rationales for upholding this idea of terroir or what I, um, I'm calling the constructed concept of terroir. So for instance, the invocation of the terroir concept has been used to mediate notions of authenticity, civility, and hierarchy, as well as local and national identity. So like we discussed in the introduction, the legal and social support for the concept that quality and taste are tied together was really a reaction, at least in France, to globalization and resulting competition. So you can see how creating and strengthening this idea of terroir could help uphold um, concepts of local and regional identity and this idea that good authentic French wine is tied to the place where it's grown. And these ideas we know from just living in this world of wine journalists and being marketed to are reinforced by these journalists, they're leveraged in marketing, and in some cases codified in law in order to help differentiate these products in the eyes of consumers. And so the literature really does show that consumers do in fact rely in part on country of origin to make quality determinations and that information regarding regional origin is useful in the marketing of wine that comes from places that have successfully established a positive brand image. Interestingly, a lot of the literature actually does not find the same connection um, for wine from specific appellations, um, at least with American populations, and I think that could be an issue of education. And then finally, uh, perhaps, perhaps the most concrete human element of terroir is the ways in which humans interact with the vineyard landscape. And in many cases, this knowledge um, required to execute the proper expression of a site is highly localized and generational, which gets you back to that um, kind of identity concept. So to illustrate this human component of terroir, and again, plug um, Dr. Hanicle's book, this is an image from um, Empire of Vines, and it's a drawing of the US propagating garden, which sat on five acres in the middle of Washington, DC. It was constructed in 1858 and um, built and maintained by the patent office, actually. And Hanicle reads this display as the federal government presenting their investment in viticultural endeavors as an indicator of national power. And saw this project is really elevating the status of the collection and dissemination of viticultural information in that era. 
So at the garden, as you can see, there's some kind of land in front and then greenhouses. The um, native indigenous grapevines were trained outside and then the hybrids and grapes from other regions, which were described as having different nationalities, were actually displayed, it was called, in um, these greenhouses. And I think it's interesting to know that this is called a propagation garden, right? Gets back to that kind of um, subjugation or unwilding of a place. Um, and what they're really sending the message is uh, we're proud of our indigenous grapes, but this land is so great we can grow anything here, which we all kind of know looking at the history of wine grape growing in America that that's not necessarily the case, um, especially on the East Coast in the 1800s. So now I'll briefly turn to the natural elements of terroir. Um, and I won't spend too much time here because I was told in practice it was a little less interesting. So. The first factor, which is by far given the most, um, what are we gonna call it? Most weight in the literature is climate. Uh, so macro climate is mostly discussed in terms of heat accumulation requirements for the plant and heat unit based indices such as the Winkler and Huglin index that Victoria talked about a few weeks ago have been used not only to assess climate suitability of certain regions for grape growing, but for growing towards the end of quality winemaking, which I'd argue is a parameter that really comes in part from our cultural and legal understanding of terroir. And then mesoclimate is considered not just in terms of temperature, but also in how relief and ge geography impact this radiation temperature vine relationship. And then microclimate is referring to the interaction between larger scale phenomena and vine management and soil properties. And I'll just say that there's general agreement in the literature that the mean climate conditions are a major driver of wine typicity in relation to origin. And this idea of typicity is also really deeply um, ingrained in our notion of terroir. So the other major natural element of terroir is soil, which has always been pretty foundational to our cultural understanding of terroir um, being just in the name right there. So this literature is looking at the impact of um, soil on terroir, meaning that it's looking at how soil parent material impacts wine quality and affects topography. It's mapping wine quality potential based on pedological classifications, and it's asking how soil impacts fine growth and wine quality. And specifically, it's considering how soil temperature impacts the timing of different phenological stages, as well as how soil impacts vine water and nutrient uptake. And it's worth mentioning here this kind of third hybrid category, which is that the vine soil and climate act as a system, and that vine material is also a natural element of terroir that impacts grape quality, despite the fact that this fine material might either be bred or um, selected for site specifically by humans. So it's also kind of part of that human element. And lastly, kind of from the systems-based approach, we get the concept of microbial terroir. Um, so some people are thinking about microbial terroir in a really strict sense, where they're looking at the impact of soil microbes on soil health and grape and wine quality. But others are thinking um, more generally and expansively um, to look at the impact of vineyard yeast and fungi populations on grape, berry, and wine chemical composition, as well as sensory qualities. And these people are recognizing that it's not just coming from the soil, these microbes, but from other in the environment, including being brought into the vineyard on equipment and into the winery by humans. So regardless of the exact origin of this terroir, of this, um, these microbes, uh, there are studies that have linked the grape berry microbiota to the wine microbes and then have established correlations with the different wine and grape sensory properties. And if you're interested in reading a little bit more about how humans interact with the land through microbes, I um, encourage you to take a look at Colleen Miles's recent book, Fermented Landscapes. So we've talked about terroir. Now we'll turn to a discussion of the four different thematic categories of wine and viticulture related research and how terroir fits into this literature. So the first category of research looks at the impact of climate change or more specifically regional warming trends and climate variability on wine and grape quality. So in these studies, generally one or more of three categories of quality metric are being used and that's critical scores and rating, um, pardon me, uh, wine price or objective data related to grape berry chemistry or um, grape physiology. So for example, 
a conclusion might be rising temperatures are associated with the negative effects on the production and the persistence of secondary metabolites, which leads to a decrease in food quality. Um, and the climate vari variable most commonly linked to wine quality is average growing season temperature, which I think is explained, or maybe you could even think of it as explained by the central role of heat human unit accumulation indices in climate change studies. Um, I will say, however, that there are some bioclimatic indices that are based on factors such as solar radiation, precipitation, and plant water status that are also being used now to um, predict the impact of climate change on phenological and physiological plant behavior. So the research that focuses on annual climate variability as opposed, as opposed to just regional warming trends actually requires um, more study. It's less well developed, despite the fact that it's likely going to be these annual variations, which um, present the greatest challenge for future adaptation. So future res or further research is really required to determine um, how variability is going to impact viticulture and wine and grape quality over time, and what adaptations are possible to mitigate the impact of this variability. And I think toward this end, it's worth asking whether and to what extent this variability will come to be considered an aspect of a site's terroir and what's at stake in that consideration. And the reason I think there's something at stake there is because um, we'll talk about later, we have this idea of terroir is immutable and climate change is telling us we might have to change the places where we grow grapes. And maybe our investment in adaptation um, will be changed depending on whether or not we really consider this variability as something that now becomes a character of our sites. So the next thematic category of research that we're looking at is comprised of studies that aim to estimate the impact of climate change on grapevine phenology and yield. So these studies are using climate modeling with historic inputs to project future changes, and they're mostly looking at a regional scale. And then in some instances, they'll also incorporate um, economic impact predictions into the model to look at the effect of reduced yields. Uh, but work in this area has found, for example, that earlier phenological events lead to higher yields and higher temperatures around bud burst and summer drought can lower the number of inflorescences for shoot in the current and subsequent season. So that's kind of an example of the conclusions we're seeing coming out of this literature. And uh, while these studies take into account various aspects of local climate, it seems again that regional temperature is really the variable that's given the most weight, which is totally in line with what we've talked about um, in terms of how temperature is treated in the hierarchy of uh, terroir elements in the scientific literature. So given the connection between phenology, yield, and quality, this research also suggests, like I had mentioned earlier, that terroir is not immutable. And this is really at odds with our cultural understanding of terroir. And um, so as we consider adaptation, we also really need to take into the account this very real tension. And, um, and that's something that will likely um, be a sticking point as we think of how we adapt to climate change and viticulture moving forward. So our third area of research um, uses bioclimatic indices and climate modeling to map and assess current and predict future vineyard area suitability. So by suggesting that climate change will impact what areas are suitable for viticulture, these studies like the category of studies described above really do pose a challenge to the legal and territorial concepts of terroir. And um, these site and regional suitability studies are actually extensions of the viticultural zoning concepts that are used to mark the boundaries of geographic areas for ap um, appellation purposes. So again, really tied to this concept of um, cultural and legal concept of terroir. And these studies um, have in the past relied a lot on opinion and actually for reference to cultural notions of quality and typicity when determining whether a site will be good for viticulture. But now increasingly we're seeing the use of scientific tools for objective terroir mapping. So here we're talking about things like chemical and biological fingerprinting, using molecular approaches that can discriminate between wines from different regions or run in different terroirs based on their different chemical compositions, as well as geospatial and other precision viticulture technologies that really allow us to model climate on a region to vineyard specific scale and assess terroir uh, sustainability at, again, a much smaller scale than we have in the past. 
And this uh, question of terroir sustainability and resilience actually requires more attention and fits into um, what we'll be talking about next, which is this last category of research um, that looks at industry adaptability to climate change. And there's really three subcategories of research in this specific stream. So the first subcategory, we're focusing on adaptive measures. And these can be short-term adaptive measures, such as changes in canopy size and geometry, or the use of shade cloth um, to moderate sugar accumulation and sun exposure, um, as well as longer-term strategies. That could be changing in your trellising system or making scion and rootstock selections that are more drought tolerant, or even re relocating your vineyard altogether. The second step category in this, um, in this larger research category focuses on understanding um, the nature of regional and site specific vulnerability. So in the past 10 to 15 years or so, uh, researchers have con been conducting stakeholder systems-based vulnerability assessments. And these are used to determine how certain communities uh, experience effects of climate change, what the, they perceive to be threats versus opportunities, and then how these uh, communities then manage the things they perceive to be as threats. So interestingly, uh, these vulnerability studies not only focus on environmental factors, but also things like globalization, technology, consumer preference, market forces, and adaptability of some of the cultural and legal institutions that uphold the terroir concept, which we talked about earlier in the presentation. And then the environmental factors that we're talking about are not necessarily limited to just changes in temperature or precipitation. We're also thinking about things like the geographic distribution of people and pests, as well as soil erosion, infertility, and soil and water contamination driven by um, traditional and continuing farming practices in these regions. In other words, there's a recognition that vulnerability is not just determined by biophysical impact of climate change, but on how communities can and do respond to those impacts based on their cultural, economic, and social realities. So that third subcategory of research um, is really then focusing on understanding regional adaptive capacity and adaptive strategies. Um, in the climate change research, a region's or a community's adaptive capacity to a perceived or current stress is a function of the vulnerability, so that's looking at exposure and impact, and then the resilience, which is their capacity to um, absorb or mitigate that impact. And then acknowledging um, the human aspect of um, of adaptive capacity, a group of authors led by Lara Bollet uh, proposed a comparative socio-ecological approach to understanding adaptive practices and planning for future adaptation that I think deserves to be continued into the future. And they argue that taking this approach will allow you to better understand how the biophysical and socioeconomic factors are related. And because the method is comparative, um, the industry may learn which analytical frameworks and adaptive approaches are easily generalized and then operationalized and which are not, which are super, super site specific. So I think more research is warranted to further develop adaptability models that take into account not just environmental and economic and social realities, um, but other cultural and legal realities at the community and farm scale, and then assessing how um, assessing the efficacy of adaptation and the applicability of these models uh, to different wine growing regions or even different communities within similar regions. So a few brief and simple conclusions. Terroir is really complex and it's hard and you have the natural and human dichotomy. You see how all of these things are tied into one another. And then on top of that, you have the layer of constructed terroir that changes depending on where you are and what you need out of the concept. Um, we, Colleen described it as almost like love. We're all talking about love, but no one knows what love really means, you know? And, but something that I do think is true that how we understand terroir will be in is being called into question by climate change and that there is going to have to be a cultural reckoning around that. And then finally, um, that a more expansive understanding of the human elements of terroir should really inform our future work on viticultural and industry adaptability and adaptation models to climate change. So um, for all of the reasons that it's set forth before, so I won't make you go through them again.
some acknowledgements. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Beth Forrestal, who is my advisor for this, but more importantly, in my heart, um, my advisor and co-instructor for a seminar course we're putting on this quarter called Wine and Society. I'd like to thank Dr. Waterhouse, my academic advisor, Dr. Cantu, the literature review seminar supervisor, my then MS class of 2021, who I'll be graduating with in a month, go us. And then for their generous financial support, the American Society of Enology and Viticulture, Wine Spectator, and Peter J. Shields and Henry A. Jastro. So thank you very much for your time and attention. So are there any questions for Lauren? Lauren, what was the name of the book that you mentioned earlier on fermentation and? Yeah, it's called Fermented Landscapes by a woman called Colleen Miles. I can send you some chapters. Thank you. Sure. I think I just like covered everything really well. So I'm fine without questions. Plus I think you're the main event, Andrew. <laughs>